publishes. Uh, okay, recording in progress. I'm. So if you know people, um, yeah, I'd be happy to know about them. Okay, okay. Fabiola, good morning. Hello, Fabiola. <laughs> How so, are you? Robert, you you will tell us when we when we begin with. Well, Robert will make a presentation at the beginning, and then I will um, explain a little bit. I will maybe I don't know if Robert will present you, but if not, I will present you, and then uh, explain a little bit about the uh, dynamics of the of the talk, and you will have an opportunity at the beginning, as I said, to to talk a little bit about the book, the okay. structure. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So Robert? Not yeah. yet? Uh, wait a second, please. Okay. Uh, right now is, it, it is recording, but, um, we're going to receive the, the signal from uh, Johan uh, mm -hmm. to stream. So when when he tell us that we are ready to stream, uh, I'm going to give a brief presentation. Uh, I think here it is. So I just have a message saying that we're going to be streamed and I'm being asked for the time. Is now streaming. Okay. That's right. So we're, we're going to be streaming on, on YouTube. The YouTube it will be for our general viewers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And after the uh, Johan's signal, I'm going to give Joe's a brief presentation about uh, all of you, and then I will give the word to our moderator that it, that it will be Alejandro. Okay. So Alejandro will coordinate times, and the order of uh, words, and so mm -hmm. on. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, Johan, so we are ready, I think. So prepare everything and just give us the, the start. Okay, we can start. Okay, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon to everyone. So uh, it is a pleasure to be here with, with all of you. Um, thanks to all the people that is watching us right now. I, we are here to present uh, the Professor Bilashek's book uh, about Kant. We are celebrating uh, in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia our tricentenary because the birth of Kant. So I'm going to present our guest. Our guest is today. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, saying thanks to uh, Professor uh, Fabiola Rivera Castro. She is a doctor from Harvard University. Uh, she is a researcher uh, in the Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas in Mexico. And she is also a professor and uh, philosophy professor in the UNAM. We have also uh, the presence of Professor Stepaneco, Pedro Stepaneco Gutierrez, who is a doctor from uh, UNAM. Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and he also works as a researcher in the Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas, and is also prof uh, professor in the UNAM and other universities. And as a Colombian quote, we have uh, Gonzalo Serranes Callón, who is um, a doctor from Universidad Nacional de Colombia and magister um, from the Boston College. Uh, he has been professor in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia for over uh, 30 years, and he's also a researcher and a translator. And um, we have um, Professor Alejandro Rosas. He is doctor from the Universitat Münster. He is also, um, he has been professor in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia for over 30 years, and he is uh, our organizer, our organizer for for oh. what join us today, and and all and obviously we have our special guest that is uh, Professor Marcus Bilashek, 
who is a doctor from uh, University of Munster. Um, he is now professor in the Goethe University of Frankfurt Main, and is the author of uh, the book that join us today, um, the, Revolution, the Revolution de Denkens. So uh, I want to say thank you also uh, to SPEC, uh, Seminario Permanente de Estudios Kantianos, um, um, that, that makes this, this possible because they are um, they are helping us with the um, stream and with this realization. Um, I want to say thank you also to the CILEC in, in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia and the groups and the researching groups in uh, Dialectica y Museometricos and Ética, Comportamiento y Evolución that are group researching groups uh, in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. So today, uh, our moderator, it will be Professor Alejandro Rosas. So I, I want to say thank you to all of you. And I just give the word to our organizer and moderator. So thank you to all of you and Professor Alejandro. Thank you, Robert. Um, welcome, everybody. And welcome very specially, Marcus Vilasek. Thank you, Marcus, for attending and for accepting this invitation. Uh, we are going to talk about his book, uh, Kant, the Revolution des Denkens, Kant, the Revolution of Thought. I must mention that this book was nominated for the German Nonfiction Prize in 2024. Uh, it's a very special book uh, in many ways, especially uh, because uh, not only he presents, uh, gives a complete presentation of uh, Kant's philosophy, but it also uh, places uh, the book in, in, the, in the context, in the historical context of his work and tells a lot of facts and anecdotes about Kant himself. And I think he wants also to uh, sort of um, debunk some myths that have been circulating about Kant's life. So, First of all, uh, I want to give the word to Marcus. Marcus, tell us a little bit about uh, when did you conceive the idea of writing this book in this way and how long have you been working on it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for participating. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to discuss my book with you. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I, this this book um, in Alejandro, you, you have asked me how long it has taken me to write, and in some sense, it took me thirty years to write. Um, Alejandro and I, we were students, uh, doctoral students together uh, in Münster, and I think I couldn't have written that book if I hadn't learned from so, from so many people over so many decades about Kant. Um, but then, given the fact that I've been studying Kant's work for um, more than 30 years now, maybe more than more than 35, I guess, um, it went surprisingly quickly to write the book. Um, and the reason is that the book is not meant, of course, for you guys here who are participate in our discussion. So this is not a book for Kant specialists. It's a book for the wider audience. And then my aim was to try to explain some Kantian ideas to people who are not professional philosophers. And um, what I found when I, when I started writing the book is that this, the, the, um, the challenge in doing that is not so much the content, because the content that's on a level where well, I mean, for me, it, it, I, I know Kant's philosophy, for, I've known it for such a long time that it's not so difficult for me to explain the fundamental ideas in, in epistemology or ethics in Kant. The problem is to do it in a way that people don't get bored, that they don't find it boring or somehow or too complicated. And 
I must say, I so much enjoyed writing the book. This is, I have never written a book that was so much fun to write as this one. So I really enjoyed doing it. And the plan came uh, up. Um, so I, I had in the back of my mind the idea of writing a book for the wider audience for the Cannes anniversary this year for 2024, Cannes 300th birthday. Um, but then, um, uh, luckily, um, the, um, the publisher, uh, C. H. Beck, who is one of the major publishers for uh, non-fiction books in Germany, they approached me and asked me whether I wanted to do something uh, with them for the country. But this was already in like 2020 or maybe 2019. Um, and so uh, I wrote a brief expose of the book and then it went back and forth. And in this process, I came up with the idea of um, not writing a, a chronological or thematic uh, or uh, thematically ordered um, presentation of Kant's book, so that you perhaps would start with the critique of, critique of pure reason, and then the critique of practical reason, and then the critique of judgment or something, but rather to try to write it in uh, 30 brief chapters, and every chapter has a topic, and um, uh, in every every chapter, I try to convey some of Kant's more abstract philosophical ideas, and in some sense to sugarcoat it with historical anecdotes, so that for a wider audience, it's it's possible to take this in without getting bored. And um, the order of the book is not uh, following the order of Kant's thought. But rather, I, I try to start with those topics that are most accessible to the general public. And um, already when I first thought about the book, I decided to start with the chapter on peace, even though this was long before the Ukraine war and uh, now the, the war in uh, Palestine and uh, Israel, um, because I felt that this is a topic many people feel strongly about and where Kant has important things to say. And so from there, from peace to uh, uh, history, to education, ethics, I work my way to the more abstract and metaphysical and epistemological parts of Kant's thinking. So that's that's how the book uh, came into existence. And I, I finished it. Um, so I wrote it basically in, I hardly dare to say this, but I think the, the writing of the main body of the text took me only half a year. Um, but then, as, as everyone who's written a book knows, there's another year of work in doing what fine, uh, so uh, fitting in the references, uh, proofreading and everything. So it was maybe half a year of concentrated writing, and then one more year which I worked on the book until it was. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, I might comment that this joy that you felt writing the book um, is really, uh, it, it's really uh, obvious for the reader. You know, it, it comes very fluid, and uh, it, one senses that the writer uh, somehow has all the content already in his mind and can uh, uh, explain it and describe it. In, in in a sort of in a in a row in a so so it's very interesting really to read it and we of course understand that the book is not written for experts but nonetheless uh, one cannot avoid making some claims when one writes a book of this nature and one has not the opportunity or the possibility to to you know to in detail explain the claims and support them. So this is like an opportunity to talk a little bit about these claims. And maybe, because I hope the book will have many editions, it, it's, it's like a book that is written so that, that it will have many editions. You will have to rework some things and maybe these sort of events where you discuss with people will give you the chance to, to change some things, add maybe things you, you didn't, uh, really consider putting in the book. So, so that's that's the idea of, of this event. And we have um, prepared a, a list of topics, and I will I will uh, share them so that so that the audience 
can have them uh, in sight as we discuss them. Um, I will share them uh, through the Zoom uh, and, and, and then we will start discussing with the most general uh, topics to the most specific maybe. So let me see. Share mm. screen. I don't see. Um, do I have a possibility of sharing here? Yes, Professor. Yes. Okay. Nonetheless, screens. Uh, okay, let me see. Yeah, funny because I cannot, it seems I cannot share my, ah, yeah, here, PowerPoint. Okay. Good. Now you are seeing it, yes? Yes. Fine. So. Professor, excuse me, you are mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now, the first topic is about presenting Kant to a wide reading audience. And there may be some uh, dangers or difficulties doing this. There are trade-offs, how one does this. And uh, so I will ask Pedro to help me now put this uh, uh, question or, or this topic uh, in words and in conversation with you. So Pedro, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to say congratulations to, to Marcus Vilasek for, for, for this book. I read some uh, chapters and I really enjoyed it, them. Uh, and yes, I, I recognize this effort to, to, to to make closer Kant's philosophy to our wide, uh, to our wide uh, public, um, and I remember uh, some uh, introductions to, to Kant's philosophy, and most of them, yeah, start explaining what is transcendental philosophy, which is the methodology, and uh, obviously uh, explain the, the third. Uh, the, the, the critics, the, the first, the second, and the third, uh, and and you decided, as you have said, uh, another way to 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 expound uh, uh, Kant's philosophy. Uh, but uh, at some point, I am thinking on the chapter on enlightenment, and at some point, when you say, "Well, Kant didn't uh, criticize enough his own ideas," because look what what he he. He said about uh, women and what he said about different races and and what he said. You didn't say something about uh, non-human animals there, but uh, you you could say it. Uh, my my concern was well, the, the problem to introduce in this way Kant's philosophy is uh, make belief to this wide audience that philosophy. It could be a question of opinion uh, and, and not to argue following uh, and uh, well that everybody can make philosophy just talking with his friends <laughs> so I, I know that that, that 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 you make also a, an effort to to avoid that but I, I would like to hear uh, how uh, you avoid this this danger well, thank you very much for your for your question, um, which is really a very important one. Um, particularly, 
since there is a tendency, and I think that's in the background of your question, in the wider public to see philosophy um, as just a matter of opinion. And um, I, I don't know whether you have in the back of your mind when you ask your question, uh, Hegel's famous criticism of the history of philosophy as just being about people's beliefs. Um, and um, of course, uh, I think um, uh, th there is really a danger there um, that um, people think that the history of philosophy consists in Plato saying one thing, Aristotle saying another thing, Thomas, von, uh, Thomas Aquinas saying the next thing, and people don't understand that what really counts is the arguments people give for their views, and right. that we all, in doing philosophy, try to get closer to the truth. And of course, this can get lost if you just present people's opinions. So I, I completely share your concern here. Um, on the other hand, of course, this is a book about Kant and his philosophy. And now I, I want to say something um, I, uh, you may find slightly shocking. Um, I don't think of myself as a Kantian. I'm, I'm a Kant scholar and a philosopher. And in my own philosophy, I share some of Kant's views, but I do not share many others. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, for instance, when it comes to Kant's epistemology, and I think we're also later going to talk about, for instance, Kant's transcendental idealism and stuff like that, I'm completely critical of that. I don't think that um, we should follow Kant here. Of, co of course, I think that Kant has very interesting things to say, things worth that we think hard about. But I, in the end, I don't agree with Kant. And so if you don't agree with someone and you still want to present their ideas, in some sense, you necessarily end up presenting their opinions. You say, this is what Kant said, record, even though I don't believe he's right. And so what you do, you present to people um, Kant's, Kant's views. And as I, I think in, in the book, I'm, I'm, I try to be not overly critical of Kant because of course I want to convey to people how interesting Kant is. But I think that in many, many places I make clear that um, uh, that Kant's views not only on, on women uh, and race uh, and uh, other uh, politically contested subjects, but also his views in epistemology, at least some of them, some of his views in ethics, um, some of his views uh, in, um, uh, in uh, his philosophy of, of nature um, are views I don't share and I at least indicate what the reasons for this. And this takes me to the final part of my answer. Um, I think the way to, on the one hand, criticize Kant and thereby conveying it's only his opinion and not necessarily the, the truth, but still conveying also that philosophy is about truth and argument is to explain your reasons why you agree or you disagree with, in this case, with Kant as the author uh, I'm trying to explain. And so, so the idea is that the readers understand, okay, here is someone writing a book about Kant. He takes Kant's philosophy seriously. And how does he do it? He does it in, in the way Kant wants us to take it seriously. He is critical of it and has critical arguments back and forth with Kant, so to speak. Um, so um, I hope that all in all, so maybe one, one more uh, thing, something I, I emphasize throughout the book is Kant's point that you cannot learn philosophy, but only philosoph uh, philosophizing. Mm. And that philosophy consists in the process of really thinking things through for yourself. And 
I hope that um, this is something I convey in the book, that that's what philosophy is about. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Uh, of course. Or, of course, Pedro, yeah. go ahead. Well, yes, uh, I agree with you that we cannot uh, follow all Kant's ideas. But it, it, it is very important, and I think that you, you made it uh, in your book, to, to distinguish those ideas that follow from his principles and from his argumentation, and other, other ideas that are not uh, uh, grounded and, and supported by, by his main principles. And I think that race, women, and, and non-human animals, one, well, non-human animals is different, but uh, but his opinions uh, about race and women are not uh, derived from these principles. And, and I, I think it's worth to, to stress this difference. And well, yes, I agree with you that it is important to introduce philosophy while well, discussing, discussing uh, topics and giving reasons for uh, one uh, position and, and, and the other, no? But it is very important to say, well, these, these ideas follow from the principles. We can discuss the principles, but these are well-grounded and these other are not well-grounded. You, you, you say something about uh, prejudice in, in, in this chapter on enlightenment, and I, I would like to hear some uh, uh, something about that because that that was a topic that that, that he teaches in in his uh, logic uh, lectures. Um, uh, why do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I um, I think I now understand uh, better um, the the point you want to raise in your question. I um, and I I want to respond by saying yes. There are then perhaps three levels. Um, on the one hand, there, there is Kant's philosophy and what, what Kant wrote and what he uh, taught. Um, and now within that, we can distinguish on the one hand between what is essential to his philosophy, what, as you say, follows from his principles, and what perhaps does not. Okay. I have emphasized another distinction, namely the distinction between what Kant himself thought and what we today find convincing okay. or what I as one person today finds convincing. And of course, these two distinctions, they um, uh, um, can overlap in complicated ways. And so for me, it's I would go so far and say many, not at least some of the things that follow from Kant's own principles and that are essential, essential parts of his philosophy are claims that I don't find convincing, where I think that Kant's argument does, just doesn't work. For instance, let me just give you one very brief example. I think that Kant's argument for transcendental idealism, the claim that empirical objects are not things in themselves, but only appearances, I think the, the argument in the end rests on the idea that we have synthetic judgments a priori in mathematics and in, uh, in the foundations of the science. Without that claim, I think Kant's argument just doesn't work. So he, particularly for space, he needs the um, synthetic uh, and a priori character of uh, geometry for his argument. And today, I think we don't have much reason to believe that geometry is been synthetic a priori. Um, and particularly, we don't have reason to believe that um, uh, the ge geometry, um, uh, or to believe that Euclidean geometry is the geometry of physical space. But without that assumption, I think, and we can't go into the details here, but I think without that assumption, Kant's most fundamental claim in his theoretical philosophy doesn't get off the ground, namely transcendental idealism. So I'm, I'm very critical of that, even though it is something that does follow from Kant's own principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have those views where Kant um, uh, says things where you might claim that these are not following from the principles of his philosophy, 
but are reflecting mere prejudices of this kind. And that would be claims about perhaps uh, race or women uh, or uh, homosexuality, uh, um, suicide, and other things. Um, now, I think this is a very, very complicated issue because, as you know, there are people who claim, at least for the issue of race, that Kant's um, uh, theory of uh, the human uh, races and um, his distinction, um, his hierarchy of races is not an accident. It's not only a prejudice, but rather something that is a central part of his wider conception of philosophy. Um, Chua Ping Lu Adler in her book uh, has made that up. Now, I'm, I'm not convinced by that. So I'm, I wouldn't say that Kant's philosophy is somehow essentially racist. Um, but then, on the other hand, one has to admit, I think, um, that it's not mere prejudice because Kant, as you can see in his articles on uh, human race, um, he puts much theoretical effort in defending his view. He has a very complicated pseudo um, uh, natural science, um, proto genetic theory of uh, the races. And um, so I would not say that it is in a completely accidental part of his work that does not belong to his philosophy, strictly speaking. So I wouldn't want to go that far. Um, maybe it's different with his, uh, what he says about women. Uh, maybe that's really just prejudice and nothing more. But when it comes to racism, I think this goes a bit deeper than mere prejudice. Well, oh, thank you very much for the, for the answer. I think that we have now a wider view of your approach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Marcus and Pedro. At this point, uh, uh, if some one of the people present, like Gonzalo or Fabiola, wants to make some comment, uh, you can you can make it. So, um... I think that we should move to other questions because the, uh, we have already oh. half an hour. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. So the second point is the Copernican revolution. And um, Gonzalo, you can please uh, present this point and the question. And uh, Pedro also had some issues there. So Pedro, you can, after Gonzalo, you can also uh, contribute. Uh, Gonzalo, please go ahead. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, congratulate Professor Bilashek. I didn't know about the prize. Uh, really, it's very pleasant uh, to, for you to get this prize, and I congratulate you. Uh, and I'm very you. pleased I'm, also. If I very quickly may say, in, in the end, I didn't get the prize, but I, it was a nomination. So I was a finalist uh, okay. among the last, the, the, the final eight books. Uh, of the year, but that was very, I, I was very satisfied with that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I am very pleased also that you choose the character, the revolutionary character of Kant's thought as the title of the book. Uh, I don't think that's ironical. I don't think so. I think it's is serious, uh, uh, and I, my, my concern is, uh, my concern is um, how to understand this Kantian revolution. Th th that's not, there is no a single answer to this question. Uh, this revolutionary character is very complex in Kant. 
is very uh, multivarious, it's, it's in several things, several aspects of uh, human life and, and philosophy. Uh, but I am concerned specifically in the Copernican character of Kantian thought. Uh, the Copernican character of the revolution of Kant's thought uh, related most of all to epistemological problems. Uh, and I, I, I am also conscious that the book is for the wider audience, but I, uh, I, have, I have seen that lots of Kantians do not understand the deep of this analogy Kant proposed with Copernicus. And then they, they are like, uh, they lead lectures, readers, they lead them into misunderstandings. And one of them is the, the one to, uh, the, the, the one in misunderstanding that characterizes Kant as subjectivist, as uh, anthropocentrist, and in the words of Russell, as contra-revolutionary and as Ptolemaic, if you remember this, uh, this, uh, this quotation of Russell. Then uh, I think it, this is not a minor question nor a specialized thing, what means Copernicus for Kant? And I have something, maybe I am obsessed with Copernicus, and that's, I have to confess that, I am obsessed with Copernicus. But I was, I, I was reading the book, the biography, the, the, the Manfred's great biography of Kant, and I, he, he, also emphasizes in the revolutionary character of Kant, but I had, I hadn't found not even one mention of Copernicus and the character of his revolutionary thought as Copernican, and I think that that's that's very shocking. I, that shocked me. That I have to confess, but. Uh, I say I am obsessed with Copernicus. Then I want to know. I want. I would like to know uh, how to evaluate this uh, controversial character of the role of Copernicus in Kantian thought. This is uh, a fair formulation of my question. Uh, I, I hear. Um. Yes, thank, thank you very much for your question. And I'm, I'm aware that this is, it, it is a, a, an important topic. Um, it's a complicated topic. So um, let me first quickly say how I understand Hans um, analogy with Copernicus uh, in the critique of pure reason. Um, and you can then say whether you agree with this or not. Um, I think the way the analogy works is this. Um, as, as Kant sees it, the great insight uh, of uh, Copernicus was to understand that um, the movements of the, the stars and the planets in the night sky are the result of really two kinds of things. Namely, on the one hand, the self-motion of these uh, um, uh, celestial bodies. And on the other hand, the fact that the observer also moves on the earth. And so what he found out is that the zigzagging motions, um, uh, for instance, the planets, make in the night sky, they seem to go one way and then again another way, um, that this is not reflecting the real movement of the planets, but rather it reflects the way the movement of the planets 
must necessarily appear to an observer who moves on the Earth around its own axis. Uh, so that's the point of the analogy. It's a point about saying, if we reflect on the perspective of the observer, we can explain how things necessarily will appear. And I think Kant wants to say something analogous about um, empirical reality. If we take on into account the perspective of the human observer, which for Kant means the perspective of someone with the uh, forms of intuition, space and time, then we can explain how um, empirical reality will necessarily appear to the observer. That's I, I understand the point of the analogy. Would you agree with that, or do you do you have? I, different... I agree completely with you. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm yes. glad that you agree. This is this is this is a, a right. You know, uh, I I we say a, a way of of correlate correlate Copernicus with Kant uh, with the text of. The, the Copernicus itself, himself. Yeah. Uh, and not, it's not a matter of heliocentrism and geocentrism and this thing that is that is that profilates in also uh, in yeah. a lot of 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 uh, of um, a lot of introductions to Kant. Then yeah. my second level of the question would be how can we uh, prolong this analogy to uh, achieve a comprehension of the transcendental, and, and that, that that's that's I, I can explain my, explain myself better. Uh, how depending is this interpretation of the privilege of the human nature? as in astronomy, the privilege of the human or the Terrakian observer. Yeah. Is yeah, there that, yeah. any privilege uh, in this relation? Or the idea is that in Copernicus, we have a rule to observe the universe that applies for every planet in the solar mm -hmm. system. Then Kant would be someone who study the rule that makes possible the objective knowledge of human nature as it would be possible by the, by the same rule, but uh, to other uh, rational non-human beings. This, can we prolong this analogy to this? a way of explaining transcendental perspectives is, is a little bit what I'm telling to you. No, I mean, that, that's of course a very interesting, but also a very complicated question. Um, so, I mean, first of all, um, when it comes to the question of, I mean, how, what does the Copernican analogy, how does it play out with transcendental philosophy? And I think, the, um, the, the way I have um, uh, tried to explain the analogy, um, the, the, the point of reference is the necessity. The necessity in saying this is how the night sky must appear to someone from that perspective. And I think Kant wants to say something analogous about the workings of our cognitive capacities. Given those cognitive capacities we have, there's a kind of necessity claim that the world must appear in a particular way. And this necessity claim transfers then to the statues of geometry, the statues of causal principles, and so on. Um, so the, the necessity and um, objectivity and validity of uh, transcendental principles in Kant's philosophy derives from the necessity of the way the world must appear to beings like this. So that, that's how I understand how this 
analogy transfers. Now, um, you, you've asked, if I understood you correctly, whether there is a privilege here um, to, the, to the human perspective. And I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure whether we are already on the second point on the, on the slide. Is this uh, because th th there are these, and you, you mentioned before, um, uh, the problem of subject, uh, subjectivism and uh, anthropocentrism. And I think that um, it's, it's not correct to claim that uh, Kant falls back into a Ptolemaic perspective in placing the human being, as I say in one formulation, uh, at the center uh, of the world. Because what is important to understand is um, what often today is called Kantian humility. Mm -hmm. The world that in the center of which the human being is placed is only an appearance. It's not the world of things in themselves. And so there is nothing, um, no hybris or no um, uh, anthropocentrism in a bad sense um, in this claim. I think a different way of saying that Kant placed the human being in the center of the world would be a different way of, uh, in a way of bringing out the, the uh, humility in this claim is to say that the world in which human beings live is only the world as it appears to them and not the world of things in themselves. So this is the big difference to um, the kind of view Russell, for instance, um, uh, uh, attributed to Kant. Russell thought that Kant was saying only, well, the world is there for human beings uh, uh, and they, they construct it and they're in the center of it. But that's, of course, only half of what Kant wants to say. Because the other half is, well, the world, the empirical world that we can understand in, in the terms of transcendental philosophy is not the world of things in themselves, but only an appearance for human beings. And maybe, and you ask about other rational beings, I think, I mean, Kant himself says that space is only a human. Uh, form of intuition, but I think he, this is an overstatement um, because Kant cannot know that there are not other uh, finite rational beings uh, who have the same kind of uh, form of intuition. So I think what Kant should have said is that if only the way um, the world appears to beings like us, and it's an empirical question whether perhaps on other planets um, there are rational beings who have the same forms of intuitions that we do or not. And, and I think Kant and the philosophy cannot uh, um, say anything about this, whether this is the case or not. It's an empirical question. I hope this somewhat uh, answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, Pedro, Pedro has something to, to add. Well, yes, my point was a minor one. A minor point, uh, and well, the, content, the Copernican revolution is is a, a metaphor, and you know, uh, when you have a metaphor, you need to to specify the feature that works in this metaphor, and uh, I think that there is this Brussels misunderstanding uh, is induced because uh, one can think on the position of the Earth instead of the movement of the earth. And the metaphor works only if one thinks on the movement of the earth, because the movement of the earth is what explains the apparent movement of stars and planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you think on the position, well, you, you, you could say, well, actually Kant was a, 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 a neo-Ptolemaic uh, and in this sense, a counter-revolutionary. Um, uh, and that, that, that was the point. I mean, it's important to stress that the metaphor works with 
uh, with movement and not with position. And I think that you in page 20, uh, in a very short uh, explanation uh, thing, uh, says that uh, das menschliche Subjekt in den Mittelpunkt der Welt zu stellen, uh, can induce to this misunderstanding. Of course, you in 26, you explain better the metaphor uh, talking about movement. That was that was my point in, in okay, but um, reference to pages. I, I I think I understand your point, but is, would it help to say that um, center of the world um, in a centrum uh, seiner Welt? Um, I I didn't intend this to be read spatial. This was not meant the spatial center. In, it was the center in a, as you say, metaphoric sense. So it's um, because as I, I so, but I, I understand this, this is um, uh, maybe misleading. So I didn't want to say, of course, that Kant placed the human subject in the middle <laughs> uh, of uh, space. Of course, that's, that's not the point. Um, rather, um, it places the human subject at the center of the empirical world in, in the sense that every feature of the empirical world is um, uh, imbued with or is structured by human forms of cognition. And in this sense, it, it, it's more an abstract sense of center here. Uh, the human being is in the center, not in the same sense in which the earth, according to the Ptolemy uh, Ptolemaic uh, system, is in the center of the universe. Of course, that's not what I wanted to say. But uh, yes. thank you for, for making me clarify this. Thank you. Yes, yes, and and I think that's related with the with the with the concept of necessity, because. Uh, in the categories of modality, when when Kant, Kant expound modality, it is clear that he is talking about epistemic modality and not what today uh, would be metaphysical or ontological modality. I mean, it is clear that uh, possibility is concerned with what we know at some point, uh, what uh, we uh, have evidence in, in when we say that something exists and necessity uh, when we understand that things cannot be another way. Uh, and that is epistemic modality and not ontological because there is a, a criticism against Kant saying, well, if we cannot say that things are necessarily only because we cannot conceive them in other way. Uh, so we should make the difference between epistemic modality and, and, and ontological or metaphysical modality, something that Kant didn't, didn't make, no? Yes, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on uh, Kant's uh, theory of modality, but it seems to me that um, even though Kant maybe was not very explicit about drawing the distinction between epistemic and um, uh, metaphysical modality, I would think that um, uh, the uh, modal categories, they are meant to be um, not only epistemic, but rather metaphysical or ontological, in the same sense in which, um, let's say, the relational categories also are not merely epistemic. I mean, Kant wants to say something about the structure of the empirical world. He wants to say that causation is something that happens in the empirical world, even though the empirical world, of course, according to Kant, is only an appearance. And I think the same thing is true about modality. Um, so when, when Kant says, what is possible is what is compatible with um, uh, the uh, possibility of experience and what is um, uh, actual is what really uh, conforms with the uh, um, uh, forms of, of experience and what is necessary is what um, is a condition of experience. 
um, when he says things about him like that, I don't think that he wants to say something only about epistemic uh, possibility. I would have thought it's it, it's meant because that's it's it's a category. So even though Kant says it doesn't contribute to the content of the judgment, mm. still he wants to say something about um, uh, possibility in the world and not only about um, uh, epistemic possibility. But I mean, as I said, I'm I'm not really an expert on that point. It's it's very complicated. Um, and but my hunch would be to say no, no. It's it's really meant to be um, metaphysical. Yes, yes, I agree. It is meant to be metaphysical, but that's a, a critical point against uh, Kant. I would say uh, it's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, point. Yeah, yes. That, yes. I agree. Okay, but now I understand you better. So you want to say Kant wants us to give an account of metaphysical um, modalities. But because of the the transcendental framework, so to speak, he, he doesn't succeed in doing that because it's only epistemic. Is that what you want to say? Yes, exactly. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I'm. I think. Um, uh, I think you're right, uh, or at least I, I think that there's a very serious point. Um, as I said before, I'm myself not at all convinced. Uh, with Kant's transcendental idealism. Yeah. And um, so I think that's one of the points in which you can one one can be critical of uh, transcendental idealism, at least in the in the official form Kant himself presents to you. Yes, I, I agree. Well. <laughs> okay, um, if I may say something about this formulation place the human subject at the center of the world, even if that is a phenomenal world, one could think that is a bit too strong because there are things about the phenomenal world that still remain mysterious in natural science. But more importantly, the future of humanity uh, by, in Kant is, you know, it's like a thing of hope. It's an issue of hope. There's no certainty, there's uncertainty there. And so if we were really the center of the world, even the phenomenal world, um, I think uh, this shouldn't be so. This shouldn't happen, but it happens. So maybe we are not <laughs> really uh, at the center of the phenomenal world. Yes. Okay. I... <laughs> I now um, uh, become aware of the fact how misleading, or at least how um, many possible interpretations this sentence uh, can have. And maybe I should um, really try to find uh, another way of making my point. Um, I would have thought that um, this rather abstract sense in which Kant places the human subject in the center of the world um, would not rule out that there are contingent features of the world that we do not control. I mean, um, what, what I what I wanted to say, and maybe maybe this is uh, um, I should have said that, and not what I'm uh, what I really said, uh, is that um, according to Kant, um, there is no feature of the empirical world that does not, in one way or another, reflect the way human beings are cognitively equipped and the way the world appears to beings like us. So that there is nothing we could point to in the empirical world that would be completely independent from our own cognitive perspective. That, that's what I wanted to say. Um, and uh, so, but, uh, and of course, you, you, maybe you, you're right um, to say that, well, placing the human subject in the center of the world is overstating that point. Um, okay, good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I look at that passage again, and I think about revising it. Um, the, I mean, in, in some sense, this returns us to the point we talked about first. Um, 
how do you write for a wider audience? And of course, you need catchy phrases for a wider audience. But catchy phrases are always, it's always very easy to misinterpret them, to overinterpret them. And so um, I think, um, so to put it differently, my hope would be that the average reader of the book will understand this play, this phrase placed, um, places the human subject in the center of the world, um, not only by looking at that one sentence, but by understanding the context. And so they, they will understand that what is meant by it is the way in which the world cognitively depends on our makeup. So to speak. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, and and I, I'd, I'd be thankful for uh, your uh, suggestions here. I mean, do you think one should avoid those these kinds of formulations, or is it okay if, as long as the context provides um, uh, a more nuanced um, uh, account so that uh, the reader can understand what is being meant, even though the, the phrase itself may, may be misunderstandable? I mean, I'm, I'm really torn here. So thank you for pointing this out to me. Yeah, no, no problem, because I hope your book will have many editions and you will find also catchy phrases that may avoid, you know, some misunderstandings. Probably not everybody will misunderstand, but some yeah. could. So... Or well, could be perhaps perhaps uh, more than than correcting something. It, it would be better to to warn. There is these two kinds of formulate the metaphor and be careful. Okay. Because... Okay. Yeah. No, I think that that's a good point. And if I remember correctly, I don't do it in the book. I sh I could have mentioned um, the Russell. Uh, yes. Book. Yeah. Yes, because that is at the very beginning of your of his book on 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 human knowledge and yeah. its limits that sounds a little Kantian no? knowledge and limits of knowledge and, and and it is at the very introduction of all the, yes. the first page I think so yeah no you're right and um I think uh, so that would be of course helpful to explicitly mention that possible misunderstanding okay. and then rule it out and say, no, no it's not what comes next. No. Mm -hmm. Fine, okay, so we can go uh, advance to the next point. And this is a point about the primacy of praxis over theory and how one can understand it and how Kant understood it. And uh, Pedro, can you please help us with this, with this point? Well, very shortly, because I would like to hear Fabiola and also the practical, uh, practical philosophy. Uh, the point is, yes, you stress uh, from the very beginning that practical philosophy and practical concerns are the, the, the main concern of Kant. Uh, but uh, at some point, uh, I think that... Uh, when I was reading the chapter of the limits of knowledge or something like that, uh, you mentioned that reason looks always for something unconditional. And uh, I, I, I think, well, I thought, well, that's, that's a, 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 a theoretical uh, point. The idea of reason as looking for something unconditional, that's something theoretical. So it seems to me a little paradoxical that the, the, the theoretical philosophy uh, have a principle that gives to practical philosophy the main, uh, the main concern because practical philosophy or practical uh, reason uh, can uh, satisfy this uh, uh, Yearn for for unconditional this uh, yeah. this point of and so I I, th I think it, it's a little uh, uh, paradoxical that the the, the the theoretical reason uh, explains why practical reason uh, is the main point uh, for philosophy. 
Yes, I'm, I, I see your point. Um, and um, I, I think, um, so the, the, the most relevant passage for that is the passage on the primacy of uh, the pure practical reason over speculative reason in the critique uh, of practical reason. Uh, where Kant, in the end, argues for the postulates of pure practical reasons, where he says that even though we don't have theoretical proof of God's existence, and we don't have theoretical proof of um, uh, um, an eternal soul, um, we can postulate these things. Um, now the argument does not go in the way you have just suggested. Kant does not say, well, in theoretical uh, respect, for instance, we aim at the unconditioned. The only absolutely unconditioned thing would be God. And therefore, um, we require from practical reason to give us somehow uh, an argument or to, to, to it's, it's for practical reasons that we believe in God's existence. Rather, the argument goes the other way around, because Kant thinks that theoretical reason as such in itself um, must follow a principle that today would be called evidentialism. Evidentialism in, for instance, David Hume's sense, and also in the sense people uh, use that term in uh, epistemology today, which is the claim that Without sufficient evidence, it would be rational to believe so. And evidence would be what is now called truth conducive. So it would be reasons that indicate that the belief is true. And of course, practical considerations in this sense are not evidence because they don't argue for the claim that the belief is true. All they do is they claim, uh, they show that the claim is somehow practically important. And um, so Kant thinks that when we only look at theoretical reason, we wouldn't, even though theoretical reason wants to um, cognize the unconditioned, given that we cannot cognize the unconditioned, we would have to remain neutral. We would have to say, well, we don't know whether God exists or God does not exist, and that's all theoretical reason can say in this but then Kant argues there comes practical reason and there comes the fact that we do have um, uh, an unconditional moral principle and that this unconditional moral principle requires of us um, to realize the highest good. But then we recognize that in order to be able to realize the highest good, we must believe that God exists and that our soul is immortal. Um, so it's only this indirect way that, according to Kant, then um, justifies us in making claims about the unconditioned. So for Kant, it's not going from the theoretical to the practical, but rather from the practical to the theoretical. I'm, I'm not sure whether this helps. Uh, is this um, kind of an answer to your question? Well, in the way you explain it, I think that you are saying, well, Precisely because the theoretical reason cannot answer and must uh, remain uh, impartial when, when it doesn't have enough evidence, precisely uh, because, like in the antinomies, you must suspend uh, judgment, yes. precisely because we reach to this point uh, and the reason still wants to have something unconditional to understand, not to know, but to understand. And, and uh, that's when practical reason comes. There, the, there is the will, there is the freedom, there is the responsibility, responsibility, answerability uh, that we need to take into account now. Uh, so, in some sense, I think that you are introducing practical uh, reason, appealing to uh, to the uh, failure of 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 
theoretical reason. I mean, the failure of theoretical reason is what uh, gives a place to the practical reason. Yes, not, yes, I think. Yeah, not I mean, concerning I... knowledge, obviously, but concerning well, uh, how to to guide our life. Yes. I mean, um, uh, I think we we uh, agree here. Um, of course, Kant very famously says in the uh, B edition of the first critique, um, I had to restrict knowledge in order to make room for faith. And exactly. so it's, it's the restricting. So um, the theoretical side does nothing more than to acknowledge its limits. Exactly. And then, because there are these limits, because theoretical reason as such cannot provide us with uh, the unconditioned, then it's possible for practical reason to fill this gap, so to speak. Exactly. But if you, if we would imagine we were beings only with theoretical reason, without practical reason, and without moral principles, we would be mere... Um, spectators, so to speak, in the world who theorize about it, then we would not get at the unconditioned. We would not get uh, what only the, the postulates or practical reason can give us, according to Kant. This is how he sees it. And I think, um, just on a, on a different uh, um, note here, I think that this is one of the most attractive features of Kant's philosophy. Um, I mean, I'm not at all a fan of his argument for the postulates of God and immortality. I don't think that these work. But the general idea to say that we are both theoretical and practical beings, and what we rationally ought to believe can not only reflect theoretical reason, but must also reflect practical reason. I think that's a very deep and interesting idea um, we, we, as, is, that is still relevant today. Okay. Now that's right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we can now go to can the I add something? topics of... Ah, you want to ask something about this? Okay. Fabiola, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not... Sure. Well, hi, Marcus. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm agreeing with what you are saying. Um, I'm not sure because um, I think I see the point of what you're saying. But on the other hand, you both of you, Pedro and Marcus, but but on the other hand, um, like uh, practical reason starts the search for the uncon unconditioned from itself also. Yes. So it's not as if the search for the unconditioned is only a matter for, for theoretical reason, but practical reason searches for the unconditioned on its own terms. So the concepts in, in practical, the central concepts of practical reason are the concepts of good and evil. So, so the search for unconditional goodness is something that is proper to practical reason. So what I'm saying is, it's not just the business of theoretical reason to search for the air condition, also practical reason uh, when you act. And well, this is not exactly Kant, what Kant says, the way I'm gonna put it. Um, yeah. It's a way of putting it. So when you act and you search for the justification of your actions, or when you say that something is good and ask whether it is good um, in itself or good, conditionally or so yeah. then then you start the search for an unconditioned for the unconditioned which is rich with the categorical imperative as you Marcus just mentioned but yeah. but the the justification or the or the search for unconditional goodness is not dependent in any way on theoretical reason so it's parallel to theoretical reason and so if we agree with this I'm not sure whether we can agree with what Pedro was saying I'm not sure I just yes. wanted... yeah. Th thank you very much. Um, and I, I think um, this was this is, is a different um, angle um, on uh, a point I, I had been um, trying to make before. Um, I think the the uh, direction of justification here goes from the practical to the theoretical. And this means that already on 
So if I just said, if we were merely theoretical creatures, we wouldn't get at the unconditioned. Um, and I, I should have added, and now you have added um, uh, very correctly, that if we were purely practical creatures, if that was possible, we, we would aim for the unconditioned. And we would, first of all, ask for the unconditionally good. And I think Kant comes very close to saying what you just said um, in the opening uh, paragraph of the section on uh, the highest good in the critique of practical reason, where he says that reason, as on uh, the theoretical side, also on the practical side, always aims for the condition of the condition and thereby for the unconditioned. And now we ask for the condition of the conditionally good. And that's in the end turns out to be the highest good. And in some sense, this is something that is um, uh, un some, some, something unconditioned completely on the practical side, so to speak. But now comes the complicated move kind of mix. He, he wants to say that merely for practical reasons, we can understand that we have to aim for something that is unconditionally good. But now the complicated thing is that in order to be able to do that, we also have to postulate something unconditioned on the theoretical side, namely the existence of God and the immortality of the soul, which are not practical um, claims, but these are existence claims. Um, God exists, uh, an immortal soul exists, that, that's a theoretical claim. And Kant wants to say, because reason strives for the unconditioned on the practical side, we also have to assume something unconditioned on the theoretical side. So that, that's the interesting move Kant was making here. Um, but I, I completely agree with you um, that um, the interest in the unconditioned does not come from the theoretical side. It's on both. So reason, and I think, so it's both on the theoretical and the practical side. And I think that the deeper reason for that is that in the end, according to Kant, it's only one reason. Reason, both on the theoretical and the practical side, is human reason. And it has, on every level, the same kind of structure in that it strives for conditions for the conditioned and thereby for the unconditioned. Yeah, may I say something? Yeah, well, I agree completely that we don't need a theoretical reason in order to, to, to have imperatives and to feel the imperatives. So practical reason doesn't need a, a theoretical reason. That's absolutely clear, and I agree. But to understand these imperatives as, cons as related to, to this search for something unconditional seems to me to be something theoretical. I mean, <laughs> remember the, 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 the beginning of the, the critic of pure reason. Uh, that seems to me something theoretical, uh, uh, a tragedy of the reason that cannot answer uh, things that cannot avoid uh, to question. Uh, uh, that seems to me something theoretical. Uh, and the practical reason comes to satisfy this search for something unconditional. I agree that uh, imperatives and uh, responsibility and all the, the practical stuff works without the, 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 the theoretical. But the interpretation of the practical reason as the satisfaction of this search for something unconditional, I think that this is theoretical. Yeah, um, I, I think I would, I would agree with uh, Fabiola here um, that um, we, I think something is missing from your picture. And what is missing is the fact that, particularly in the critique of practical reason, Kant also works with the concept of the object of practical reason, which is the good. And he thinks that the same dynamic of starting with something that is conditioned, and then you ask for its conditions, and then for its conditions, and that takes you to some the conception of something unconditioned. 
The same dynamic you find in theoretical reason, you also find already in practical reason in the search for something that is unconditionally good. So I think what we have to distinguish here is the categorical imperative, which is unconditional, and the highest good, which, which is an object, an object of pure practical reason, which is unconditioned. And I think going from the categorical imperative to the unconditioned, unconditionally good object, the, the object that is good and includes everything that is good, that's a move Kant locates already in practical reason itself. So it's not merely theoretical reason. It's also all already practical reason that has this kind of dynamic dynamic in itself. Is this Fabiola, would you would you agree? Yes, yes, that's what I was trying to say. Yes, thank you. Okay. Touche. <laughs> no, but it, I mean it's it's uh uh, it's just an uh, um, addition to what what you have been saying, and um, I mean, not not many people, I think, um, look at these passages in the critique of uh, um, reason. But people read the first 30, 40 pages, and then they read the they read the stuff about um, uh, uh, the postulates, but th there's stuff going on in between and not not many people um notice this and and so i think the impression people you have is one many people share that it's really all this kind of uh, thing um, and you may know about this whole, whole literature on the supreme principle of pure reason in the first critique and people think that this is a purely theoretical uh, thing in kant and um, I think it's um, not many people notice that there's also something similar going on on the practical side. Okay. So you're you're not in your uh, in uh, in good company. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much. So now we can go to discuss particular topics of Kant's practical philosophy, starting with where we could. Call Kant's liberalism and Fabiola, please. Yes, thank you. Well, um, thank you for your book. I enjoyed very much reading it. Um, and and I want to take this opportunity to ask you on these questions that are, you know, that matter to me, which is the way in which Kant is Kant's political philosophy, philosophy of law, is interpreted from. <clears throat> let's say an Anglo-American perspective, like Anglo people in the US and Canada uh, tend to read Kant's political philosophy as if um, they could just claim Kant as one of their own, not as the way in which they are liberals, like Rawlsian type of liberalism, then Kant is, is like a forerunner. So there's not much difference in the approach. And, and I wanted to ask you about this. And how you see this, this way in which Kant is being read. And in particular, I mean, to, to put it more specifically, <clears throat> let's take the enlightenment and religion. I mean, you, you can take it from whatever perspective you want to take it. I mean, it's up to you. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, in, in, from my point of view, something that <clears throat> I care about is um, whether Kant thought that the state had a role in promoting enlightenment at a social scale. That's something that drops out from the Rawlsian type of contemporary liberalism or <clears throat> sorry, Anglo-American liberalism. And whether you think that has a place in on Kant's own views and, and also uh, religion. Um, because um, um, Kant was very critical of religious practices and this is something that contemporary Rawlsian type of liberals, liberals are very reluctant to endorse. They just want to say, no, people have very different conceptions of the good, different. And so they, <clears throat> they will not engage in any kind of uh, criticism of religious practices and whether um, this criticism is necessary for their political philosophy. This is something that I'm going to take up. So it's not clear to me 
uh, how to relate or what you think, how we can relate Kant's criticism of religious practices on the one hand, and the role that the, and whether there is a role for the state to play or whether this criticism has some place in politics according to Kant, or it's just only for the philosopher and the state has nothing to do with it. Um, so yeah, those are my questions, but you can take it, the general question from whatever yeah, no. you want, yes. Thank you, Fabiola. These, these are excellent questions and um, I think they are very, it's not so easy to respond to them. And the reason is that I, my impression is that Kant is not very explicit here. The, the problem being that, of course, Kant is a thinker of the late 18th century. And um, in his time, liberalism, and I think we can also see this, uh, of course, in the classical uh, liberal tradition like uh, uh, Locke or uh, the um, founding fathers uh, of the, 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 the authors of the American Constitution and so on. Mm, the worry here very often is that the state um, uh, does too much, that the state somehow interferes into people's uh, private lives and into people's uh, free decisions. And I think, um, I mean, the term liberalism in, uh, in the continental tradition is tied to this classical form of liberalism, where the, the main point is to uh, defend people's liberties. Whereas um, liberalism in the Rawlsian sense, of course, is um, uh, about the possibil of possibilities under which people can make um, a rational or reasonable use of it. Um, and we don't find much in on, on that second uh, kind of liberalism in Kant, at least not very explicitly. So I think what one has to do here is then really reconstruct. So it's uh, there's not much in Kant on these issues, like for instance, how much should, should the state do in order to allow for uh, a rational discourse in society. Um, a question that, of course, in Kant's time was very important, a question that in our time is very important if we think of the social media. Um, I mean, should, should they be regulated by the states in order to um, somehow fend off all kinds of um, uh, um, disinformation and fake news and everything? Is this uh, a task that the, the state should uh, take or not? And if, if you look um, for an answer in Kant philosophy, I don't think that we find much of an explicit answer. And this may be disappointing, but I think it's just a reflection of the fact that the um, questions we discuss today are not the same kind of questions or the, 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 the social problems we are facing today are not the same kind of problems Kant was facing in history. However, having said this, I think implicitly we can find many interesting uh, uh, points from which we can then, in a Kantian spirit, construct arguments um, that would um, uh, answer the kinds of questions you have been raising. Um, and in my book, of course, this is not going into much detail here. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm not, not a political philosopher in, in my own work. So uh, this is not something I have very much to say about. But I think, um, for instance, um, if, you, if you look at what Kant does in the essay on enlightenment, he does say officially and in the forefront, all we need is uh, freedom of the press. So all we need is a fundamental liberty and the state to stay out of the picture and not get involved and not have um, uh, state censorship. And then everything will be fine and we'll have enlightenment and progress. But if you look more closely, you can see 
that comes very well is aware of the fact that also what you need is publishers. You need um, authors. You need a public conversation. And Kant is aware of that. And so I think we could construct a Kantian argument here from the necessity of um, uh, a public discourse to the possibilities, um, uh, sorry, uh, the conditions of the possibility of a public discourse. And if some kind of state intervention or at least some kind of state regulation is necessary in order to make a, a public discourse uh, possible, I think then we, we have good country reasons uh, uh, to make sure that these conditions are obtain. And I think for this reason, so, so the idea would be something like a transcendental argument, right? Um, what we do want is um, a functioning um, public discourse as the basis for political decisions and democratic uh, uh, vote. Um, we need certain conditions to be in place, for instance, not only freedom of the press, but also newspapers or some kinds of means of information um, uh, or, or means to convey information to the public that is reliable. Well, if that is necessary for um, a public discourse to function in the way we need it for democracy, then we have a good Kantian reason uh, for the state to make sure that these conditions obtain. Sorry, is, is this clear enough as an answer to your question? No, yeah, that, that's very helpful um, because, um, well, as, as you explain and as well, um, like Kant's conception of the state um, is very different from what you were mentioning, like Locke's conception of the state. So for Kant, the state is very strong and has a very important, has a lot of um, like uh, competent, uh, like tasks to fulfill. Um, it's not a, a minimal state in any way. So one can say that he has a lot of regulatory tasks to perform, to carry out. Yeah. And you were mentioning like the conditions for, for a public discourse, but one can also think of education, for example. Yeah. Like Kant doesn't say anything about it, not specific. He's, as you say, it's very important to remember the time when he was writing. But, yeah. but given what he says about the economy, for example, the, he starts. He says a few things along those lines of this, the the role of the state in regulating the economy, or on setting the conditions for a functioning uh, economic relations. Then one can also maybe extend that reasoning uh, or that argument for education. And so the state has to provide the conditions for the possibility of a public, uh, as you were putting it. And it's not only newspapers. And, but also like educating the public for it. I, would you agree mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, the only thing I, I was um, wondering about is, and you said in, in Kant, there is um, a strong role for the state um, beyond um, the mere providing of uh, uh, um, the legal framework in which people uh, conduct their lives. I agree with you. But I, my impression is that this is not very much at the surface of the text. You have to dig a little to find those passages and you have to interpret them and to construct a little in order to arrive at that. So it's not as if Kant's account is his official and explicit account of the uh, For instance, uh, in uh, um, the doctrine of right, would emphasize these things very strongly. Rather, it's only inside remarks. So when it comes to the economy, for instance, there's this famous uh, remark Kant uh, makes not in the doctrine of right, but in the doctrine of virtue. Where he says that, well, um, people um, uh, uh, try to be virtuous in giving for charity, but they have to be aware of the fact that uh, it was only good luck and bad government that makes the differences in uh, in wealth and income so strong that some people need charity and other can give it. Now, if, if you read these passages, you can infer from them that Kant was thinking, 
Well, good government would be one in which people don't need charity, but rather in which social security is provided for everyone. But this is only a side remark in the doctrine of virtue and does not occur in the official text, in the doctrine of right, where he deals with the state and its tasks. So I, I think in the end, I completely agree with you, what you're saying, but I would only want to point out that this is not something that is very much in the forefront of Kant's own thinking, and that we do have to do some uh, interpreting here and uh, to give Kant a helping hand, so to speak, in bring these things uh, to the fore. Yes, okay, thank you. No, yes, I agree with you, yes. Thank you. So, we come now to the second point in Kant's practical philosophy, where probably we will have to dig deeper into Kant's um, thinking, and this is the reparation of past wrongs. Uh, yes. Thank something? you. No, yes, I was very struck when when I read this passage in your book. Um, well, I'm I'm I I don't have to read it like people. Um, when you you talk you're talking about a criticism of colonialism, and then you say that what Kant says they could be used to derive far-reaching claims for reparations and restitution, and I was um uh, I was very struck because um. Uh, I would have thought that justice for Kant is forward looking. Not, he doesn't, as far as I know, but correct me if I'm wrong, there's no place where he makes any claims about reparations or restitutions. Uh, on the contrary, like everything he says about justice um, seems to be like forward looking, uh, in particular at the level of international relations when he talks about. Peace, uh, peace, peace treaty, he says, um, I don't remember the exact wording, but the idea is that states have to like, like start anew, like forget, like close all grievances, past grievances and move on. Um, and this is something that Arthur Ripstein in his book on, on the law of war and peace emphasizes. And also you can find that in Kant's views on revolution, like after the, the revolution has succeeded, then like move on, the new regime is legitimate and, and people, I mean, like there's no perspective from which you can look back and, and fix past wrongs. So I don't know whether you agree. And, and also this forward looking character of Kantian justice um, parallels his views on morality also, where what it, the important thing is not for you. To, so the important thing for you is to know how you ought to act, what you ought to do, and move on. No, no, it's like improve. It's not so much about correcting what you've done uh, wrong in the past, but try to be better. So, so this like forward-looking character of Kantian justice and morality seems to me, I thought was um, yeah. that's the way I read it. I understand it. So how. Do you square this claim about reparations with this? Yes, thank you for, for this very interesting question. I mean, um, first of all, I should say that when I when I say that we can find in Kant um, materials for an argument um, for wide range wide ranging uh, um, retribution or uh, 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 reparation of past wrongs uh, from colonialism. Um, I didn't want to say that this is Kant's own view, but rather that we can find elements in Kant that would one could appeal to in making such an argument. The, uh, the next point is the, the, the elements I was thinking about were in particular Kant's account of property and his um, account of proper property transferal. Um, which in the end means something like this. Property um, is uh, legitimate if it can be traced back to legitimate acquisition. Uh, so that, that's at least part of Kant's argument. There is original acquisition of property. And if you can trace back your 
uh, property to some original uh, legitimate acquisition, then your own claim to property is legitimate. And I, I, all I was thinking was that, okay, if, if we agree that many cases of property acquisition through colonialism were not uh, legitimate, then it follows that the following steps also were not legitimate. Now I'm aware of the fact that Kant himself sometimes said things like, okay, but you can't dig into the past uh, too much. And um, at some point you must say, uh, uh, people own what they own. Um, and um, it, it doesn't matter uh, how they got it, uh, you, you have to make a clean slate. So. But I think um, this refers only to the trans to the to the step from um, uh, the uh, state of nature to building a state where you can then no longer once you have a state you can't go back and ask okay uh, in in uh, for um, uh, state times how did someone get their possession I think once you have a state. And you can pursue back the chain of uh, property acquisitions. Kant is committed to the claim. If there was one bad link in it, then your your present claim is no longer, at least not no, no longer uncontested. So that that was the idea I was working with. Um, so I would say that uh, we we could argue, based on some Kantian ideas, that. Claims to property people now have that go back to uh, illegal acquisition through colonialism, they are at least contestable and they should make us rethink whether we have to do some kind of repara uh, um, um, reparation. Now, you say, doesn't this conflict with Kant's generally forward looking perspective on justice? And I want to say, yes, Kant uh, is often forward-looking, but there's one big exception, and that is uh, um, uh, his theory of punishment, which even though it may not be as re retributivist as it looks, has one very central element for retribution, namely Kant says that you have to um, uh, take one in, in, so, if someone has killed, they have to be killed. If someone has stolen, they have to give back the property and make comp compensations. Um, now, I'm not one to defend Kant's view here, and it's complicated uh, and it's difficult to interpret. But all I wanted to point out here is that Kant is not always forward-looking when it comes to justice. Uh, he's also sometimes backward-looking. And so I don't think that this is not in keeping what I've been saying, is not in keeping with Kantian principles. Um, but in the what you're saying about punishment, like a bigger symmetry there, is that in the in the case of punishment, as you explain, like Kant uses this as a criterion for the kind of punishment, yes. and there is an authority in charge of deciding this. Whereas in the case of colonialism. Um, it's not a criterion for something else, like looking back to what happened. So in the case of punishment, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's backward looking in the sense that we need a criterion for determining the adequate punishment for the crime. And there's an authority to do that. And in the case of colonialism, we don't have an authority to determine this. So it's completely indeterminate. Who is going to say, um, what was illegally taken from whom, mm -hmm. from which perspective. And that's one difficulty. So there's the, the asymmetry breaks down. Yeah, yeah. And also this, in the case of colonialism, you don't need a criterion for something else, like in the case of punishment. You need mm -hmm. to look back in order you know, as a criterion for punishment, but not in the case of colonialism. So I would think that the analogy is not, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not completely. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, um, but so what about this? Um, one might try to turn this argument around um, and argue as follows. Okay, you are completely right, and I think it's an important point that um, uh, we, we don't have any authority uh, who, to decide um, what were the wrongs done by colonialism and what would, would be adequate um, ways of compensation. And this is in analogy to Kant's argument for moving from the state of nature to um, the civil state is an argument for having international courts that can adjudicate these kinds of issues. I mean, I think one thing is very obvious. Great wrongs have been done by colonialism and many people today still profit from those wrongs and other people suffer from those wrongs. I think this is very hard to deny. But if that is true, um, uh, you, you might argue not from uh, in, in Kant's own words, but in Kantian spirit, so to speak, that something has to be done about this injustice. And since within the society itself that is concerned, it is not possible to come uh, to have an authority that is neutral. What we need is international courts of uh, justice who um, help uh, in this kind of situation by trying to hear both sides and trying to find a just uh, solution for these kinds of problems. And I, I think that would be um, a possible way forward. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, when the United States today debate the issue of how much compensation would be adequate, and there are some people who say almost nothing, and other people say like 300 billion or something, or in, in, incredible numbers, well, of course, the people who discuss these issues, they are not impartial. And so Kant's main point about the um, uh, uncertainty and um, uh, indeterminacy of many legal issues is that because of that, we need courts. And maybe the same thing goes here. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, but But what... Like I said, if, if we think of like Kantian just or Kant's conception of justice or Kant's views of justice as forward looking, I mean, if we think of it in that way, I want to say that I prefer that view. I think that correcting past wrongs, I mean, I'm not going to deny the ills and wrongs of colonialism. I and mean, of course, you're right that people keep continue profiting from past wrongs. Um, I mean, of course, but the question is how to address. I mean, if, if the question is how to address injustice today, like I go with Kant, with, if we take him as a forward looking view of justice, that there's a lot to be done um, to correct injustice looking to the future. So to correct injustice now, regard, I mean, and forget about past wrongs. The, the, mm -hmm. the past is gone and yes, of course, but there's a lot to be done like with immigration, for example, or with, yeah. uh, that today so so i think that the forward looking view of justice is just very powerful it seems to me um and there are good reasons to recommend it and doesn't have the additional difficulties um that correcting past wrongs have it seems to me but anyway yes. that's yeah, just I mean, my personal I, yeah i i understand um uh, your point and uh, I also, of course, see the difficulties um, uh, that come with trying to correct past wrongs on this historical and uh, um, uh, this level. Uh, it, it's it's almost impossible. What I like about that perspective is that um, it somehow is able to undermine um, the sense many people seem to have um, many people who profit, uh, still profit today from colonialism and its wrongs, that somehow what they now have is really theirs and they have a legitimate claim to it. 
and therefore they argue from a position of superiority. And I think that's not correct. I think um, people have to be aware of the fact, uh, people in, in the global north, um, that many of the privileges we possess are not earned by our own fair uh, work or fair um, dealings but are um, uh, based on uh, acts, criminal acts or acts that, are, uh, that were not uh, uh, le legally uh, correct. And uh, so I, what, what I, maybe, maybe a compromise here would be to say, yes, we have to think about the future, but in doing so, we have to be aware of the fact where our own relative positions in society come from historically. And we shouldn't leave that out of the picture. Yes, fine. I think that was a very good uh, compromise in the end. In order to do something forward looking, we also have to do something backward looking. So, Marcus, this has been a very long discussion, and I want to ask you, are you open for the last two questions? Oh, yes, I am. Yes. Okay, because th these are about uh, philosophy of nature or theoretical philosophy, and I'll try to make them short. <clears throat> there is a passage on page 252-253 where you refer to the gap between the a pri a priori laws of nature and the particular laws of nature. And you refer to this gap in two ways. And I wanted to ask you if these two ways are two ways of reading Kant today or two ways in which Kant himself refers to this gap because they seem to be very different. And, mm -hmm. and one is saying that maybe the laws of nature are chaotic and there are no regularities, despite the fact that we have this <clears throat> general cause and law, uh, maybe when we look uh, at particular sequences, we will not be able to find uh, uh, the particular laws. And that would be the second way of referring to it, because it's more like we are not able, even though they are there. But the first way is like, maybe they are not there, because nature is chaotic. So. So how do you, do you think this, these two readings are Kant, uh, in Kant himself, or these are two different ways of reading Kant? Yes, I mean, I think that these two views are compatible in the following way. Um, given Kant's transcendental philosophy, and um, the fundamental role, uh, the principle of causality plays in nature. There are two worries one, one might still have. So we do know from uh, the critique of pure reason, if we believe Kant's argument there, that nature um, must have a causal structure, that things do not happen uh, just by chance, but everything that happens has a cause. And if something happens uh, uh, from a cause, this means that there is a law of nature somewhere in the book. But now there are two possibilities here. One is, and that's A, um, that laws of nature are very, very fine-grained. And perhaps also natural kinds are very fine-grained. So that basically uh, this glass here and the glass in uh, my uh, glasses here, even though they are both made from glass, the laws of nature that hold for them are different. And the same again for this glass and the glass that looks very similar. So it might be the case that even though there is regularity in nature, it's only on, on the one hand, a very, very general level, everything that happens has a cause, and on the other hand, on a extremely particular level, uh, so that for glasses that for us are indiscernible, 
different um, uh, laws of nature. And, and this would make it extremely difficult for us to find these laws of nature. Um, and um, but even if that is not the case, and we don't know this, if we only look at Kant's argument for transcendental philosophy, it may still be that there are laws of nature, but they are so complicated that we can't find them. So um, I think both is possible, both are um, possibilities that are not ruled out by Kant's argument in um, uh, the principles chapter of the first critique. And so you are right, maybe I'm not very clear in distinguishing them, but I think that they are both relevant for uh, Kant's concern. And that um, uh, in, um, so my, my hunch is that in the critique of the power of judgment, Kant is more concerned with um, uh, the, the second possibility. And in the opus postumum, he's more concerned with the first possibility. But now, say, yeah, please, please. When you say chaotic, then you don't mean that there are no regularities, but that no. they, they are maybe at the very, very particular fine-grained level that we will not be able to discern. So this seems to be the second possibility that although the laws are there, we will not be able to find them. And when we find some laws, maybe they apply on a certain level, but when we go down more, they don't apply anymore. Yeah. But in the end, every particular event must be you know, governed by a law. And so all comes down to the second possibility. And the problem, because I know, as you say in the book, Kant was really worried with this problem into you know into his old age in the opus postumum it was mainly maybe about this gap so uh, maybe we should read him as saying that the particularity may be so fine-grained that we will not be able to find uh, all the laws but not maybe in the sense that there are no laws uh, because it doesn't seem to be compatible to, to say those things. Well, I mean, um, uh, for, for the, the first possibility that um, there are, are only, so you, I, th I think you're right. For Kant, there have to be laws of nature. And so what I meant by the first possibility is that these are so fine-grained that they are hard to find, but that doesn't imply that we can find them. It means it's difficult to find them, but we perhaps we can find them, perhaps we can't. And this is why I think that the two possibilities should be distinguished. And there's another reason why they should be distinguished, because even if it was not the case that uh, laws of nature are very specific. Rather, I mean, we perhaps we find them in Newtonian physics and in uh, genetics and in chemistry and everywhere. And so we have all these wonderful laws of nature. It's still possible that there are also laws of nature we cannot find. And that's, of course, Kant's view about uh, organisms, where he thinks that the causal laws that would explain um, uh, the generation of uh, the, the uh, uh, coming to be of uh, organisms, they are epistemically unaccessible to us. And not because they are too fine-grained or too complicated, but because of the way our minds work and because of the way organisms are structured. And these two things, unfortunately for Kant, they don't fit together because organisms are structured holistically but our ways of explaining things are bottom up or top down, but not never holistic. And so, um, uh, according to Kant, there is a, a reason for the second possibility 
that is independent from the first possibility. So even if there are wonderful uh, laws of nature we can discover, there still is one phenomenon in nature, namely organisms, for which we can never find the laws of nature that explain, explain them according to Kant. And so I think it's important to keep these two possibilities distinct. Thank you, and uh, th that takes us to the, to the last question about organisms. And uh, what I wanted to point out is that in this chapter about teleology, you place the emphasis on the explanation of the functioning of organisms, of the laws that explain how, you know, how organisms work. But there is, I think, a different interest in Kant that has to do with the origin of organisms, in a sense, the origin of the first organism uh, from inert matter, from raw matter, as, as he says in mm -hmm. some passages. So raw matter is dead matter, it's not living matter. But uh, if organisms are matter, just matter, there must be some transition. And it, I think Kant considers this as real, that there must be some transition between raw matter and organisms, yeah. because if not, he would have to say God created organisms from matter, and he doesn't want to say that. He wants to give matter some credit. But he denies completely the possibility that we will understand this transition. And, and there's this famous passage on, on, um, on the Newton uh, that would, ex the Newton-like scientist that would explain the origin, the generation, of the blade of grass standing for the simplest organism that Kant could think about then because microorganisms had not been discovered as far as I know. But um, this, this, I mean, Kant was very, was very insightful in, in, in seeing that to explain the passage from raw matter to an organism would be like explaining the emergence of teleology within matter. And that is something that, for example, this Descartes had no idea about. He was confident that this transition would be explained by, by science, but he never saw the hard problem of of life, and that is how can life emerge from inert matter, you know, that just works by the laws of, of, of mechanics, of Newton, and, you know, mechanical laws, yeah. efficient causes. How can that explain the, the origin of teleology? And I think this is a very interesting point because it shows Kant was really very insightful on the problem of the origin of organisms. It's, yeah. it's a very hard problem for scientists as well, although every scientist believes science will crack it in the end. But, you know, there is a, a hard problem there. So yeah. I, I just wanted to, to point out that you don't mention it, and maybe it would be nice to, to mention it if, if there's a future edition of the book. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. The, the, the motto, the motto of, of this chapter is, is, is paragraph eight. from that passage, and I don't go much into that uh, later. You're absolutely right. And I, I agree with you. The Kant uh, here, as in so many other places, is extremely insightful, um, and he uh, has this fantastic sense of what the real problem uh, is. Um, it's really amazing. Um, and maybe maybe Kant even um, uh, has a point here that is still valid today, namely 
we know that there must be some kind of transition between inorganic and organic uh, matter. And perhaps, as I just very briefly indicated before, perhaps there is a constitutional reason why we will never have an explanation of that transition that is satisfactory to us. Because it is a kind of explanation our minds are just not made for. As Kant, Kant thinks um, that the only kind of mind that would understand this kind of transition would be an intuitive intellect. One that does not work stepwise by adding cause to cause and then explaining a phenomenon, but rather that takes in the phenomenon with all its um, uh, causal background, so to speak, at a glance. And our minds are not working that way. Um, and, uh, and of course, as you already, I think, as you also said, uh, Alejandro, um, the emergence of so-called emergent properties, whether this is life, whether this is consciousness, whether this is something very simple like the different um, uh, aggregate, is this aggregate states? Like, you know, why is it that water comes in three kinds of aggregate states, namely uh, fluid, ice, and um, uh, um, what's it? Uh, not not fog. Sorry, vapor. Vapor. Thank you. Um, so. Um, as far as I know, um, there are still no satisfactory explanations of these things. Um, and maybe Kant has a point here that this has to do with the way our minds work. Uh, so that would be one possible reason why we cannot so easily come up with explanations. Yeah, but I, I very much welcome your suggestion. Thank you. Well, so if nobody else has an additional point to discuss. We already have had Marcus here for almost two hours and a half. Or, uh, so uh, I, I would like to thank you all, and especially Marcus, for accepting the invitation and discussing with us this uh, very interesting book on Kant. I hope really uh, it will enjoy a very uh, and much very future editions so that future generations can also profit from reading it and learning about Kant's thought and his life. And of course, also, we, we didn't talk about the myths about Kant's life, but the myths you try to, to debunk. And I, I think it's very important also uh, to see philosophers in, in a real uh, historical perspective uh, that, that is that is uh, compatible with the real facts of his life. So thank you very much again. Uh, we enjoyed I, I would this. like to thank you. I, uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, serious um, uh, reading of my book and your very helpful and interesting questions and for a very interesting and lively discussion. This was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you and, and congratulations. Thank you. And I, I'd like to thank Alejandro for organizing this. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the invitation, for bringing us together. And say hi to Gonzalo. <laughs> hi, Fabiola. Hi. <laughs> I thank you uh, for your presentation, your attention, and for the commitment to do these kind of things. I think we have to repeat this kind of events, a presentation of relevant books, uh thank you very much for all that and yes thank you there are many topics that of which we we could still uh, discuss uh, lots of things yes uh, well congratulations once again marcus yes, you also thank, thank you robert and the organization yeah have a great have a great day uh in your part of the world our day is already ending um, and uh, so in, enjoy uh, the hopefully nice fall weather and uh, take care, everyone. Good yeah. night. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.